Well, thank you for joining me for this episode of She Thinks, a podcast where you're allowed to think for yourself. I'm your host, Beverly Hallberg, and I'm excited about the second episode of the Independent Women's Forum podcast relaunch because our topic today is focused on something we all need, the ever important ability to bounce back from the curveballs life throws at us, or in other words, how to be resilient. Well, our guest today gives us some great insight on how she persevered through family relationships, health struggles, work difficulties, and more, and all while trying to laugh along the way, or as she would say, what doesn't kill you makes you blonder. Janice Dean is here with us today. You probably have seen her on TV. She is the Fox News senior meteorologist and has a new memoir out called Mostly Sunny, which is now a New York Times bestseller. So Janice, first of all, congratulations, and thank you so much for coming on She Thinks today. Oh, my pleasure, and thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And I, I want to let you know, I just finished your book this morning. I, there's so much I could ask about your background, which we will get to. We'll get to some of the health issues, even sexual harassment in the workplace, which is especially appropriate during the Me Too time in our country. But I'm actually most curious about your decision to write about your life. I'm sure that's a hard decision to come to. Um, what was it that made you say, I want to talk about my life and put it in this book? Was that a hard decision for you? I think over the years, uh, as I've told people some of the stories uh, that I've been through, I always say to myself, my goodness, that would make a great story for a book someday. Uh, and there, there's been moments where someone has said to me, well, that would be a great story for your book someday. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I've always like thought of the possibility, but to actually sit down and write it um, was you know, it was quite a feat, uh, but I enjoyed the process. I know a lot of people will say, is it therapeutic? And there is something very therapeutic about writing stories that have happened to you and realizing while you're writing them and putting them on paper that there were very pivotal moments in your life that made you made, make decisions that brought you to the point that you are today. Like if I had not had... Um, you know, a, a very traumatic event happened in Houston, which I write about, which we can talk about. I mm-hmm. uh, had a home, a home invasion, a terrifying home invasion in Houston that happened that really changed me and made me decide, okay, is Houston where I really want to be? Am I happy here? How do I heal? And that made me go back home to Canada for a very short period of time. Had I not had that experience, I wouldn't have moved to New York City and met my husband and had my family. So just writing all of those moments down and realizing, you know, kind of, um, you know, putting the points and lining up all of those points and, and, and putting them together. Um, it was very special. Um, I, the one thing that I go back to when I see the book is when I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis almost 15 years ago, uh, there wasn't a lot of books out there that gave me hope. I was really searching for something that, um, I could sort of grab onto and say, oh my gosh, well, this person has this. Uh, I, I could be okay. Um, because I did read a lot of books about MS, and there were, there were some books that were optimistic, I guess, for lack of a better term, um, but really not what I was looking for to when I really needed some sunshine when, in, right. during a very par- dark period of time. So I, I think also this book is a book that I would have liked to have read when I was sort of in my darkest moments. And I'm sure that that's probably one of the scariest things when you hear a diagnosis. It's what does this mean? And what does this mean for my future? And I know in the book, you even talked about one of your colleagues who you've talked to, Neil Cavuto, who also has MS. And so people who have these health issues, they do seek out others and get information. Would you say in the past 15 years, obviously you're sharing your story, um, but do you feel like there is a lot more information and has, when you go on TV and talk about this or write articles about this, do you find that a lot of people are reaching out and saying, I'm so glad somebody is talking about it, that they too are struggling to find information? Absolutely. Uh, Neil Cavuto was a huge hero to me. And I think we need more of that. Uh, Selma Blair just came out with her diagnosis and I applaud her for doing so. It's a tough decision to make, but the moment you uh, put yourself out there, uh, you are doing more good for people who are living with not only MS, but any kind of chronic illness to make you feel like you're not alone in this. 
Uh, so I was really lucky to have Neil Cavuto in my life. He was just, you know, a few doors down uh, on the 17th floor, and I was able to go talk to him. Had I not had him, I don't know that I would have, you know, succeeded uh, in my workplace and, and done great things and had a family and maybe even written this book, you know. So I think he made such an impact on my life because of his openness to discuss a diagnosis like MS. So I wanted and- to sort of be that person for someone else. And I'm sure there is even this extra special aspect of it that he's in your industry. He's at my same workplace and he's still doing what he loves because you even mentioned in the book, it's what does this mean for my career? And and that leads me to another question I'm curious about. And at the Independent Women's Forum, there's a lot of talk about policy and how we can improve policies for, for people, um, including in the workplace, including women at work. Was there something specific that, let's say, Fox News did to help with this? How What would you say were good policies or or good policies that can be instituted for people who are going through different chronic health issues? It's a good question. uh, And I think it needs more attention. Um, I think Fox was very supportive. And I think it was because they saw Neil uh, getting up every day, doing a show, despite having an illness. I know when I was newly diagnosed, I saw a wheelchair in my future. I thought my career was going to be over. I had a lot of people say to me, don't tell Fox, this is Mm. going to be used against you. Um, And for people who have chronic illnesses, work is very important to us. We want to have, want to feel that we are contributing. Uh, And I know that having this career has helped me, given me the confidence that I've needed in very uh, trying times. I'm, I'm somebody that loves to work. And I love to tell Neil, you know, I've probably taken less sick days than a lot of people who don't have a chronic illness. Um, now, having said that, I've also had to take some time off for times that I have been ill uh, because of the illness. But I think it's really important uh, for workplaces to get it, uh, that, you know, you can't discriminate against your uh, your workers that work for you. That's illegal. And instead of making us feel like we're less worthy, embrace us and, and, and have more opportunities to speak in the workplace about living with a disability or an illness. And Um, and, yeah, I, I find when people go through different challenges in life, I think it often makes them work harder, appreciate things in a different way. And I'm sure when you got this diagnosis, you don't know exactly what it means. It probably brings a different perspective to the workplace that you go to every day and having the ability to do that in a place where you can, even with this diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And I've had so many people over the years that have come up to me or emailed me and said, hi, Janice. I'm so-and-so, I was just hired at Fox News, I have MS, and I, I felt okay with telling Fox News that I have this illness because I see you every day and you're doing so great. So thank you for letting it be possible to open that door and not be afraid to tell my employer because, you know, they see me, they see me being an example, they see Neil being an example, and yes, I do believe there is something to that, that if you are presented with a challenge, Uh, especially for me, I've always been somebody that has been maybe to a fault. Like, if you tell me I can't do something, I'm going (laughs) to prove you wrong. I'm going to prove you wrong, and I'm going to do it 10 times better. (laughs) And and something I personally just wanted to know, you mentioned in the book that autoimmune diseases, which MS is, takes a lot of different forms. Um, What it does to different people really changes because it is about the immune system and how it responds. How are you doing today? How are you feeling? I'm doing great. Um, I last year had a bit of a setback. I went through a, what they call a flare-up uh, and had some symptoms and had to take some time off work and, and figure out what was going on. Um, and I was on the same therapy for probably about 10 years. Um, as soon as I was diagnosed, they put me on something pretty quickly, which I'm very grateful for um, because I, I think that if had I not been diagnosed when I was and I didn't, wasn't on a type of therapy or medicine, I probably would have gotten worse. Um, so the fact that I was on something fairly quickly and I was diagnosed relatively quickly helped me out. Now, last year I had a pretty good 
big flare up and my doctor, my neurologist said, okay, now we need to get a little bit more aggressive. The therapy that you've been on for 10 years has worked well, but maybe now is the time that we uh, put you on something else a little bit more, um, you know, I guess, uh, powerful. Um, I'm on right now I'm on an infusion, which is once a month. And, um, you know, there are risks associated with it, but sure. the benefits are out, out weighing the risks that are associated with it. So I feel great, Good. Um, but I'm also very grateful that every day I get out of bed and I can stand up on my own two feet and I can, you know, uh, it's a good day. Yeah. And, and I think you sharing, not just that story, I'm sure, like you said, there was this fear, what is Fox going to do? And people recommended, maybe you shouldn't tell them. But I think a theme throughout this book was how, when you speak about things that are true about your experiences or your health, which you just mentioned, it actually pushes away the fear. And I think positive things have come from that. I think that's a, a perfect way to talk about um, something that was really a theme in the book, which was about sexual harassment, being mistreated by men. And I want to talk about all the good men in your life because there were so many good men, but you were very brave and you talk about this in your book and in light of the Me Too movement, um, some of the issues that Fox News has had in the past and how you and other women did speak out about sexual harassment. And I know this is like a really big topic, uh, but in light of the Me Too movement, what would you say when it comes to your experience and what we're seeing today, uh, what is kind of your overall view on where we are? I, I I personally think there's some positives that women can come forward, but I think there's some negatives mm -hmm. as far as people conflating different issues. And so I'm curious about your take on it. It's a really good, complicated question. And when I wrote the book, I wanted to write about my experiences, not only with other, uh, you know, harassing bosses, because I've had, you know, I think every job I've been in, unfortunately, as a woman, I've had uh, awkward or, um, you know, not comfortable situations with men that are more powerful than I am, the dynamic there. But I've also had some wonderful men in my life that have helped me along the way, and I point those people out, and I champion those men in my life that have been so great. Um, but when I sat down to write it, I wanted to write a fair assessment in my life of, of those challenging moments when it comes to um, harassment in the workplace. Um, as far as Fox News goes, I, I was harassed by Roger Ailes, the CEO, back you know when I was hired 15 years ago. Right. It happened during. It happened before I was hired, and it happened after I was hired. And um, you have to also understand where the place I was coming from before that. I was working for uh, um, Don Imus, who people know is a, a very famous announcer. Um, and that uh, work environment was very hostile. So I needed to get out of that work environment. And I want to just say, Janice, when I was reading what you experienced, my heart hurt for you. But I know that this is an experience that so many women have. But the way that you were treated there, I'm reading this and I'm like, that is horrific. Um, yeah. And I'm so glad that you are sharing that story because I think most women in the workplace have faced something along those lines, maybe not as dramatic as that or not as yeah. horrific. But there, there really has been a... For you, you you have probably in the industry that you're in maybe brings it on a little bit more. Um, but I, it, from what I could tell from what you said, the book, you handled that so well. And that had to have been extremely difficult. It was. So I will say the one good thing, the great thing about the Me Too movement is giving us a voice now. Right. Back then, you, did, you, you didn't have a voice. People saw this kind of behavior in the workplace, no one said anything. There was, was there an HR department? I mean, for me, it was just my whole career. I've kind of just uh, bobbed and weaved through these situations where I'll laugh it off or remove myself from the situation or, um, you know, get, try to get out of the job that I'm in. Um, when it came to Roger, he, I didn't want to paint it black and white. I think a lot right. of people, like you mentioned, this Me Too thing, it's all either black and white. They're either Darth Vader or they're, you know, uh, angels. And it's not that way. Roger did amazing things. He hired me. I, I love the place that I work at. I wouldn't be at Fox News if I didn't believe they had changed. Uh, and it's a testament to Fox to let me write about this uh, you know, uh, really, um, you know, emotional time for not only me, but many women that were going through um, 
these types of situations. Um, so I wanted to paint the picture of Roger, hopefully so that people see he wasn't a monster. He, he did, uh, he certainly did harass women. No question. There were many of us that risked, you know, risked our careers to go to the law offices of Paul Weiss to tell our stories together, um, doing the right thing. Even, even if, you know, Roger were to find out and maybe, you know, uh, listen, this, what happened with Roger happened before all of Me Too. So we were terrified to go in and talk about the boss, thinking that he would probably never leave. So during that time, was, you, this movement hadn't even begun. And at great risk to our careers, we did something that we, you know, had no idea, you know, what kind of earthquake was going to come from it. And I did, and not that I knew Roger Ailes, but um, I love that you didn't paint it as black and white. I thought that it's was not. really key. And I also love that woven through this whole decision, not only were uh, whether or not to say anything, not only are you talking to Megan Kelly, who you talk about in the book, um, other women, but you also had your husband Sean supporting you along the way. And I thought it was just such a good juxtaposition to show there are good men out there. There are men who behave poorly in a wide variety of ways. Um, but I just love that your husband was, was so supportive. And I did love that you drank a lot of wine along the way, which I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we have, we need like little ounces of courage along the way. Yeah. But that's a good point is, listen, my husband was very supportive uh, and I told him everything. And, and he was obviously a very sympathetic ear, but he was also somebody who championed uh, women and going in and doing the right thing, even if it meant risking my career and, you know, risking uh, the salary. I mean, he's a fireman and God bless him. Uh, but I, you know, if we didn't have my salary, we wouldn't be able to have the mortgage that we have. We wouldn't be able to live in the neighborhood we live in. So, you know, he basically said to me, you do this because this is the right thing. Yeah. And so I, I appreciate this book talking about it. it. It gives a lot more context to prior to the Me Too movement. Before I move on to the last topic I'm trying to talk about is being a woman on TV and weight and all those types of things you talk about. One final thought or question I have for you on this on this um, area is what do you think workplaces can and should do in light of the Me Too movement? Anything that you found really beneficial or a change that Fox News made that you found that this is this is really good for women who have been harassed in the workplace. Well, we have a female CEO and her that name helps. is Suzanne Scott <laughs> and she is a huge champion of women. I've known her for all of the 15 years that I've worked at Fox. I believe her when she says she had no idea what was going on uh, behind closed doors. Um, I, she has been open and honest and wanting to make a change in the workplace. There have been, um, mentoring meetings with, with women and helping young, um, em women employees that come to Fox news. Um, when you go into the bathroom, there is a sign on every bathroom wall saying, here's the number to call. If you feel like you're harassed in your workplace, here are the people that are, that work in HR that work on your behalf. So I, you know, instead of going into the bathroom to cry about these things, now you have, you know, signs on the bathroom uh, saying here is where to go if you feel uncomfortable in your work environment. They're, they've made a complete 180. I feel very safe in my workplace, probably my first time in my whole career where I don't feel fear anymore and I don't have to bob and weave and like, take myself out of an awkward situations. Uh, it really is, you know, it's the, I think it's the safest time to work uh, right now because we are so hyper aware. Uh, and, and I think more companies have to, you know, put strong women in roles of management. That will help. It's not going to solve all the problems, but it's certainly going to help. And I think also as women ourselves, instead of, you know, tearing each other down, we really need to support one another. We, I have a great, uh, you know, network of women that I work with that I adore and love and would go to in a heartbeat if I felt uh, that anything was making me uncomfortable or upset. So that's another thing. I think we women have to be our own advocates and help each other out. 
I agree. And and I think when you talk about women tearing each other down, this transitions perfectly to the last thing I want to talk to you about. And it's how women can be really mean about how other women look. Uh, you were very transparent in talking about some of the comments you've received from being on TV. You even shared what size you wear in a dress or in a skirt versus a top, by the way, we're the exact same sizes. So I understand and feel your pain on sometimes it's hard to find clothes that fit exactly right. Um, I do some TV work as well. So I feel some of that same pressure to be perfect. And often I think it's us doing it to ourselves and other women doing it to each other. How have you been able to navigate that? It's a very hard thing sometimes to be insecure about an area, but still putting yourself out there. What do you feel like you've learned and we can all learn from actually just being okay with ourselves? I think you hit it on the nail. We have to be good to ourselves. I've asked women over the past few years what they don't like about themselves. And more often than not, they'll tell me something that I would have never noticed. So (laughs) I think we're our worst critics. Unfortunately, we're on TV. It's a visual medium. I... I've always been a radio gal. I love radio so much. I, I, it's what, how I started out. I didn't start out thinking that I was going to be in a radio, uh, in a television career. So, um, you know, I love the fact that I can tell a story. And right now, I'm wearing like sweatpants, and I've got my hair up, and I don't have any makeup on. Uh, and I love that, and I feel more confident this way. Um, but listen, we're in a visual medium. There, I think we have made strides. I think. Um, strides in that, uh, you know, there are more of us out there that maybe aren't the Barbie doll type. Uh, and I'm trying to, uh, uh, to be an advocate of like all shapes and sizes should be on television. I think Oprah did a great job she did. Uh, being out there and I miss her. I miss her because she was just such a great representative of women you know, a powerful woman that doesn't look like, you know, uh, the Barbie doll or the very thin size four. I, I, I've I been there where I've had a wardrobe person say to me, oh, next, you know, right next to me, I've got a woman that's a size two. Oh, you're my, my favorite size. And then she looks at me and says, oh, that's not going to fit you because it's not going to fit over your hips. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I, I just think there needs to be more of us out there and we need to be more accepting of ourselves. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've been through many challenges in my life, and I feel like the reason why we are given challenges is to kind of, you know, reset and refocus. And the most important thing to me is, you know, going home and seeing my kids and seeing them smile at their mom. They don't care if their mom is a size eight or a size four or a size six. Uh, You know, I don't want to be unhealthy, but I want to be healthy. And listen, I'm the first one to say I hate Spanx. I do wear them, but I love taking them off. (laughs) (laughs) And put on the sweats and put the hair up. (laughs) That's right. And I think it's another, it's another point of being a supportive women of other women. Uh, You know, so I think we still have a long way to go, but, but we're getting there. We are. And I think it starts with ourselves in many ways. Like you said, what we think is our biggest flaw, often people don't even think that. So I think it's also not the self-hatred that we often have. Um, But final question for for you before I let you go, if somebody is listening to this podcast, um, they're going through some of the hardships maybe you went through. Maybe they've found out they have a health problem or maybe they have some background family issues. You talk a lot about your dad in the book, for example. What would you say to them if they're in the midst of something hard? You talk about um, mostly sunny. What about those dark days? Any any way or anything that you would encourage people on and just trying to persevere and, and continue on? Well, my therapist uh, gave me a very good uh, saying and expression, and she says, don't go there till you get there. And I love that expression because mm-hmm. I think if we're going through a really challenging time, especially as working moms, we're always thinking, okay, oh, what's going to happen next tomorrow? Or what's going to happen in a week from now? Or what's happening in a month from now? We don't have control over that. We really, you know, we just have to kind of live in the present um, and realize that, you know, things will work out. Things are going to be okay. Um, sunshine can come in all sort of, sorts of different forms. And sometimes we have to make our own sunshine. We have to look for that silver lining. I was in a, I've been in dark places all the time, but I'm lucky that I have a support group of a great husband, a great family. I have great girlfriends and lean on those people. You know, I, I think so many times when I was going through challenging moments, I really just was in a dark corner and I wouldn't reach out. You know, 
people are there to help one another. And I think we just need to realize that, is that when we are going through a dark time, uh, you know, lean on people. Because more often than not, um, someone can give you a smile or a word of encouragement, and that can change a day. Uh, it really can. And I always instill in my boys, you know, always be kind. You never know what someone is going through. Um, so I would say that. And, you know, on the flip side is I think we all have to be better people too. Uh, we all have to, um, you know, stop and smell the roses and realize that today's a good day. Let's make today a good day. And sometimes you just need to wear yellow, as you said, to help brighten your mood. Sometimes <laughs> that, that helps that, out. <laughs> that helps out tremendously. There have been many times where I've worn yellow on television and all of a sudden I feel like I could conquer the world. <laughs> well, we so appreciate you taking the time. And for those out there who want to get the book, it's called Mostly Sunny. Janice, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you for reading the book and passing it along. Uh, I, I appreciate what you do as well. And thank you all for listening. We hope you take away something new from today's conversation. And if you enjoyed this episode of She Thinks or like the podcast in general, I would love it if you would take a moment to leave us a rating or a review on iTunes. This helps us ensure our message reaches as many people as possible. So share the episode, let your friends know that they can find more She Thinks episodes on their favorite podcast app. And from all of us here at the Independent Women's Forum, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.